Hi, welcome to our first uh, CG2271 uh, tutorial 1 video recording. Okay, so in this first tutorial, basically what we are trying to discuss here is uh, the thinking process behind uh, the various software design techniques uh, that we can use uh, to fulfill the requirements of a project. Okay, so um, in this first question, we are given a stopwatch. Okay. And uh, as you can see, it, this stopwatch uh, state transition diagram, it has two states, stop state and running state. And the behavior is also described here. And as you can see, um, when we press uh, initially by default, when we go out from reset, we go to the stop state. And if I press the start button, okay, it starts the stopwatch. And if I press multiple times while I'm in the running state okay it will continue running without uh, resetting anything once i press the stop button it stops the stopwatch from counting and if i press clear it zeros out the uh, elapsed time if the stopwatch is not running that means only if i'm in the stop state okay if i'm in the running state then the clear button is ignored okay at the same time we are also given that there is actually this hardware uh, timer okay that generates an interrupt okay every one millisecond okay and uh, this uh, one millisecond hardware interrupt timer actually is uh, updating a variable which can be read as the elapsed time counter okay and um, what we are needed to do is we are need to display the uh, update the display uh, 10 times per second so that is uh, every 100 milliseconds okay so every 100 milliseconds we are required to update the display of this stopwatch Okay, for question one, uh, we are asked to design the pseudocode uh, using event trigger scheduling with interrupts. Okay, so what is this event trigger scheduling with interrupts? Basically, what we want to do is we want to be able to first, uh, uh, in our main program, okay, what we want to do is do some initialization of all the necessary variables that we need for the program, and we make sure that the current state or the initial state of the system is set up correctly and subsequently we can just go into a, a while one loop okay a while one loop uh, where we may not do anything and since we have interrupts okay we are going to be using the interrupts okay to uh, tell us whenever an event has occurred okay so since each button can generate interrupt we will have uh, interrupt for the start button okay and we will have an uh, interrupt for the stop button. Okay, we will have an interrupt for the clear button. And we will have an interrupt for the timer. Okay, so we know that the timer interrupt basically happens every 100, uh, sorry, every 1 millisecond. Okay. Uh, other than that, the other interrupts, okay will be basically be triggered whenever the button is pressed okay so this is basically how uh, such uh, an approach is taken when we say it is event trigger scheduling with interrupts okay so the ability of the buttons to generate interrupts is actually uh, very beneficial for us because we can now tie uh, all these input trigger points to interrupts okay and get the fastest possible response for the system Okay, so let's see uh, how we can actually design it. Okay, so as mentioned, the main thread here will initialize the state. Okay, uh, after that, uh, we will initialize the necessary variables. In this case, we have two variables. Okay, one is the display delay, which is 100, and the other is elapsed time, which is 0. Okay, so this elapsed time will basically be incremented. Okay, the moment. I press the start button and this display delay of 100 is basically used okay to keep track of the interval in which I need to update the display okay and um, the moment I press the start button what happens so initially when I boot up the system I'm in the stop state and if I press the start button I come into this interrupt and I update my state to running Okay, so the timer ISR will always be running regardless of whether I press any button or not. Okay, because it is a hardware timer. Okay, so if I'm not in the running state, I will not be doing anything. Okay, but once I'm in the running state, okay, that means I already pressed the start button. Then you can see that two important things are happening. 
the elapsed time is starting to increment and the display delay is starting to decrement okay and uh, what will happen is every time my display delay hits zero okay because i start from 100 and every time it hits zero it means it is time to call the display function to update the display with the correct time and as well as to uh, reinitialize or sorry update the display delay uh, variable with the correct value of 100 so every 100 milliseconds this will happen okay how about the other button so we can see that the clear isr i will check if the state is stopped then only the elapsed time will go to zero and for the stop isr basically i change the state to stopped okay so this is a very good uh, way of uh, implementing systems uh, making full use of interrupt capabilities and uh, why this is preferred is because of the uh, fastest response that interrupts give us okay uh, that allows us to come up with a very efficient system okay that fulfills the requirements of the project okay so that is the uh, sort of discussion for question one now let's go on to question two in question two uh, it is the same idea except that right now we are using a static scheduler without any interrupts okay so without any interrupts means that means there are no uh, button interrupts okay there are no button interrupts so this is the important thing but we still have the hardware timer right we still have the hardware timer so every one millisecond we still have the timer in isr uh, timer interrupt being triggered okay and since I do not have the interrupt capabilities for other buttons, then the only uh, other option that we currently uh, can use is the uh, polling approach. Okay, so let's look at how we can go about uh, designing this uh, system. So uh, initialization wise, you can see that by default, when I come out of reset, I'm in a stop state. Okay. And I can uh, display my current elapsed time counter. And the next display update is set to current elapsed time counter plus 100. Okay, so every 100 millisecond, I want to update my uh, display. Okay, so that is why we have this next display update variable. And in terms of polling, you can see that it's basically a while one loop over here. And inside this while one loop, I check for each button at a time. So I first check for start button. Uh, and after that, I check for stop button and check for clear button and so on. And this sort of gives you uh, quite clearly why this is not a good approach. Because if I have uh, multiple input devices, multiple buttons or switches, then you can imagine that I can have many, many if statements that I need to go through. Okay, which would uh, really if, uh, uh, impact the real time nature of any system. Okay. And it adds a lot of uh, unpredictability to how fast the system is actually able to respond when an input is uh, sent to the system. Okay, so that is why I mentioned earlier that the approach in question one is actually very ideal uh, for such systems. Okay, so coming back to this question, uh, we can see that we are actually implementing the same logic except now in polling approach. So when the start switch is pressed, I will check my current state. If it is stop then I can change my state to running state and I take a copy of the elapsed time counter to update the start time. If I press the stop switch, I check if my current state is running. And if my current state is running, then I take a copy of the elapsed time counter and put it into stop time. And I change the state to stop. Okay, how about the clear button? If the clear button is pressed, uh, I must check if I'm in the stop state. Because only if I'm in the stop state, I should clear the output correct so i set start time it goes to stop time okay so now let's uh, see what is happening so in the first three if statements over here what i'm doing is i'm just uh, setting the state based on the button that is pressed and also updating the variables with the elapsed time counter very uh, value now uh, every 100 milliseconds i'm supposed to update the display correct and how do I do it is over here. Okay, so you can see in this line, the elapsed time counter will check if it's greater than next display update. Because next display update is always updated to be 
the elapsed time counter plus 100, correct? So every 100 milliseconds uh, time, I will satisfy this check, correct? Then I come into this if statement and I check if my current state is running. If my current state is running, then I display my current time take away the start time. So the start time is when? Is the time when I press the button. So this is the when I press, okay, the start button, okay. And after that, the elapsed time counter is still running, correct? So this difference here, elapsed time counter minus start time, this difference will always give me the amount of time that has passed from the moment I press the start button, okay? Now, if my state is not running, what I will do is I will display stop time minus start time. Okay, so what is this stop time minus start time? So this stop time minus start time is basically either if I press the stop button or clear button. Correct. If I had pressed the stop button, okay, the stop time would have been the elapsed time at the moment I press the stop button. Okay, so when I press the stop button. Okay, so this display would show the difference between the timing intervals when I press the start button to the moment I press the stop button. Okay, but what if I had pressed the clear button? If I had pressed the clear button, then what would have happened is I would have done this where both of them are equal. So I would have displayed a value of zero. Okay, so if clear button is, is been pressed, okay, then I would have displayed a value of zero. If clear button pressed. Okay, and then what I do is I also update the next display date variable to be 100 away from the current display date value. Okay, now um, this is again basically the pseudocode to implement the same functionality but using uh, if else statements in a polling approach okay uh, so a few other things that we can discuss over here also that are interesting uh, firstly you'll notice that uh, the variables start time and stop time okay are not uh, initialized start time and stop time are not initialized here okay so if they're not initialized, um, we cannot assume them to be any value or to be zero. So it is uh, important that we initialize the values, okay? Uh, because in the case that my uh, display uh, or my system is running and I've not pressed any other button, but I press the clear button, or oh, sorry, if I not press any other button, then I will be displaying this, correct? In the stop state, I will be displaying this, which is stop time minus start time, okay? So if stop time and start time are not initialized, then I could be displaying some random value instead of zero, okay? Before I press any other button, okay? So we should rightfully initialize the values. So what can you initialize them to, okay? So you can initialize them to zero, okay? So you can set both of them to zero, okay? So that uh, there is no uh, confusion about the value. Um, uh, one of the other options I think that uh, you may think about is how about I initialize them to the elapsed time counter. Okay, so I want to take start time and stop time. Okay, both to be equals to the elapsed time counter. Okay. And what is this elapsed time counter? This is the variable that is updated by the interrupt, correct? The variable that is updated by the interrupt uh, every one millisecond. Okay, if I want to update it with the variable that is updated by the interrupt, uh, what is important is uh, we should avoid a race condition. Uh, in this week's lecture on the interrupts, we actually uh, talked about a race condition. And uh, what is the race condition? Okay, so if I try to do something like this, okay, start time equals to elapsed time counter 
and I say stop time equals to elapse time counter if I write these two statements okay uh, this leads to a potential race condition why because between these two lines of code uh, interrupt can come in that can affect the elapsed time counter value correct okay so this is what uh, we should avoid so rightfully if I want to use elapsed time counter what I can do is I can say start time equals to elapsed time counter and then I say stop time equals to start time okay uh, why is this better because I read from the interrupt only uh, or the shared variable only once subsequently I use the local variable to copy into another variable okay so I avoid a possibility of a race condition happening and updating my elapsed time counter between two subsequent reads okay so these are some of the uh, things that we need to take note of okay which we will also be exposed to more uh, as we go along in this uh, module okay how to make sure that the integrity of data is there okay especially when we are dealing with shared variables okay uh, in question 3 basically it is uh, asking you for a flow chart for the previous solution okay and a flow chart I think uh, most of you know how to do a flow chart so I'm not going into too many details here but basically you can see that all I'm doing is uh, at each point I'm trying to check okay if uh, something some button has been pressed okay and if it's pressed I do something if not else I do something else and then I check the next button and I check the next button and so on okay so a flow chart is just to showcase uh, the flow okay of how the code is sort of being executing uh, in the in the, in the, uh, the controller okay uh, so I'll not go into too many details here uh, because I think you have sufficient uh, exposure with designing flow charts to represent your code Okay, uh, the last question is basically uh, uh, looking back at uh, how a system uh, or the different ways in which uh, we can uh, uh, schedule tasks okay, uh, with different durations and to minimize the response time. Okay, so in this case, uh, in this question, we have three tasks, task A, B and C with different durations over here. And what we want is uh, we want to uh, look at what kind of uh, sequence uh, can make task C have the minimum response time or maximum response time okay now the first one is uh, question part A which is static non preemptive scheduler uh, if you recall from the slides a static non preemptive scheduler basically is something equivalent to what we call a round robin okay a round robin system in a round robin system basically uh, one task uh, it goes goes around okay uh, one task after another in the same manner okay so I can say a b c okay or b c a or c a b okay and then it just loops back okay loops back loops back okay um, so in a uh, round robin system or a static non preemptive scheduler system the best case okay the best case is if uh, task c starts immediately at time t equals zero okay so that's the best case so the uh, okay so in that situation task c starts immediately so the total time is two okay so the Worst case response time is two, uh, two units of time. Okay, what is the worst case? Okay, so the worst case is if task A first, then followed by task B, then followed by task C. Okay, so the total time would be three plus one plus two, which is six. Okay, so this is uh, basically how a static non preemptive scheduler behaves that means uh, you go in sequence and there is no changing of the sequence uh, no matter what happens okay so if task, T, task C is scheduled to run first then that would be the best case scenario uh, or 
the worst case is task A, task B, and then task C. Okay, so that is the worst case scenario. Okay, how about B, where I have a dynamic but non preemptive? So, dynamic and non preemptive, what does that mean? That means the ordering of the task can switch around, uh, the ordering of the task can switch around, but it's non preemptive. That means once the task has started, I still have to wait for that task to finish before the next task will run. Okay, so even though I reorder, uh, the, the next task has to wait for the current task to finish, and that's why we call it non preemptive. Okay. Now, uh, again, what is the best case? Okay, so the best case is task C starts immediately. Okay, task C starts okay, uh, immediately. So in this case, T is equals to 2. Okay, so no matter uh, what happens, task C starts immediately means that's the best case scenario. Okay, what's the worst case scenario? Okay, so the worst case scenario is uh, the, the task that is the longest duration that can task that can start before task C and that is task A. It means task A starts followed by task C. Okay, so in this situation, what happens? Okay, so let's look at the timeline here. So if task A, if I look at the timeline, if task A comes here, okay, and then a few uh, units of time later, task C is scheduled to run, all right? So the worst case response time is A must finish, which is three units of time, then C must finish, which is another two units of time, which is total of five, okay? But if you look at it from the time that C was scheduled to run, okay? From the time that C was scheduled to run, you can take away this small fraction of time here called epsilon. So you say phi minus epsilon. Okay, so this epsilon here is basically referring to what? It's referring to the slight difference of time from the moment task A started to run to the moment that task C was scheduled to be run after task A. Okay, uh, so of course epsilon uh, can go all the way down to zero if assuming that immediately after task A was scheduled to run, task C was scheduled to run. Okay, so epsilon can go down to zero, but this is roughly how you can see the time. Okay, so we are looking at the time from the moment task C was scheduled to run. Okay, so it was scheduled to run just after task A began to run. Okay, so there is a small slight difference. So that difference is what we call the epsilon. So the worst case scenario is 5 minus this epsilon. Okay, so the last one is dynamic preemptive scheduler. So this is basically how a OS sort of uh, behaves, where any task can take over the CPU at any time. Okay, so in this situation, okay, we say the best case again is task C starts immediately. Okay, and in that situation, T is equal to two. And the worst case, okay, in this case, the worst case is any other task just started running. Okay, so any other task, task running, okay, but immediately preempted by C. Okay, so if I look at the timeline, okay. So let's say at this point of time, uh, task A was running, okay? And at any point of time, the moment task C is scheduled to run, and if task C is given higher priority, it will immediately take over and start to run. So from the moment of time that task C was scheduled to run, it will take two units of time. So the worst case is also <coughs> two units of time. Okay, so you can see that uh, this a dynamic preemptive scheduler is of course the best, okay, uh, because of the fact that the moment a task is given uh, the highest priority, you can actually take over the CPU, okay, and execute its code. Uh, of course, uh, it also adds there is some overhead which we uh, haven't really covered yet. So whenever you are forcefully uh, 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 or you're forcing one task to give up the CPU so that the higher priority task can run. So at this point of time, okay, at this point of time here, 
there's actually a contact switch that is happening. Okay, a bit similar to the contact switch uh, that we have learned for interrupts. Okay, but for tasks, there are of course more things to uh, factor in. But so there is still some slight delay uh, because the the task A's context has to be saved onto its stack. Then task C has then has to be loaded and it will begin to run. Okay, so there is a small amount of delay that is associated with the contact switch. Okay, but for now we we sort of ignore all this first to just understand how the uh, scheduling mechanism behaves. Okay, so this question is basically to get us to understand how these different type of schedulers uh, behave, okay, and their timing, response, and characteristics. Okay, uh, so that sort of wraps up tutorial one. Okay, so I hope with this tutorial you have some uh, good recap of the different software uh, design methodologies. Okay, so to, just to recap, the first question here. Uh, we look at uh, having a main loop with just minimal code, okay, and subsequently everything else is handled in the ISR, okay. The second one is assuming there is no ISR capability or buttons, then you go back to the polling approach, okay, which is very inefficient, okay, especially when it comes to scalability, okay. And uh, third uh, question is on flowchart, uh, which is uh, very straightforward. And question four is on basically reviewing uh, scheduling mechanisms, okay, and how different schedulers can actually behave. Okay, so uh, that sort of wraps up tutorial one. Uh, thank you for watching, and, and uh, look forward to the next video for tutorial two. Okay, thank you.